So it is my real pleasure to introduce Joan Benoit Samuelson. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Hicks, for the warm um, welcome. And um, it's really a big pleasure and a delight for me to spend time here in the community of UCI. As you know, 31 years ago, I spent a little time in a neighborhood not too far from here. And it doesn't seem like all those years have, have passed um, so quickly because I'm still out there doing what I did 31, 32, 33, 40 years ago. And not too much has changed because I'm still very passionate about what I do. And I'm very blessed to have long, a really lengthy career and I've enjoyed longevity of a sport that I, I really love. And I'm not sure what I can attribute that to exactly because there are many factors that have comprised um, my joie de vie, if you will. Um, I think it's very important that we all live a balanced and healthy life if we're really going to um, enjoy life thoroughly. And so um, when I say balance, I talk about balancing the mind, the body, and the spirit. And I think many of you can understand why it is important to, to balance those three components of one's life. Because if something goes awry, you have something else to fall back on and something else to propel you forward and keep you motivated. So I have put together a little slideshow. Um, and uh, we'll start right here. Um, moving through life is the theme of the day. Um, and that relates um, very closely to a campaign Nike ran with me. Um, I'm going to hold on. Well, what am I going to hold on to? I guess I'll turn this on and hold on to this so I don't have to. Can you hear me now? Um, um, it, moving through life relates to a campaign uh, Nike ran with me in the early 1990s called There Is No Finish Line, thus the title of the film we just saw. And back then I really didn't understand what There Is No Finish Line meant. Um, and I don't think Nike realized who they were choosing as an athlete to be the, the front runner of that campaign. And so um, what I've discovered is that because I have such passion for sport, that every time I cross a finish line, there's a new reason or a new goal to keep going, looking for the next starting line and then the next finish line. So these photos right here pretty much chronicle the beginning of my career and where I am now in my career. The first picture was in my hometown of Cape Elizabeth, Maine. My career as a runner pretty much parallels the um, history of Title IX. And I started high school in 1971. Title IX legislation was enacted into law in 1972. And the story starts there. Now, back then, track was not a varsity sport for girls. It was just a club. And the longest distance a woman could run back then was the 1,500 meters or the metric mile because the so-called experts in our sport thought if a woman ran more than a mile, she'd do, do bodily harm and never be able to bear children. <laughs> well, two children later and 150,000 miles later, I'm still out there running. And, uh, you know, I, I keep saying, how much longer am I going to do this? When am I going to stop running around in circles and figure out what I'm going to do with my life? But what I have found <laughs> is that my running has led to so many different opportunities. And really, for me, I was in the right place at the right time. OK, so this is the campaign that Nike ran with me in 1990. And they wanted to have some snow in the shot, so we had to travel a little further north from Freeport, Maine, where we reside now, to this is South Paris, Maine. And they wanted to find an, a long country road. And 
I don't know why we had to travel anywhere because this is very similar to the roads I run on on a daily basis. Okay, so why run? Well, having grown up with three brothers, I was always running to them for help or running away from them because I had taunted them in some way. And my parents really um, enjoyed physical activity themselves and they wanted us to play outdoors in a healthy environment. And so outdoors and play were synonymous with the joy in our lives back then. And I think that today, and we can get into this a little later, and I know some of the other talks are going to um, center around youth and activity, there's not a lot of play today for kids. There's a lot of organized sports, and so when Kids can't pick the teams and make the rules and sort out differences and figure out, you know, what the, what the, where the ball really should be. Um, we can't really um, expect them to make important decisions later on in life. And with all the technology that's out there today, I don't think there's a lot of personal interaction in solving uh, problems or um, disputes or differences. And I think that when you play outside and have nothing but you and your friends and your opposing teams and the neighborhood and um, people who are really passionate about what they're doing, then you can really experience play at its finest. And if you're enjoying play as a youngster, chances are you're going to enjoy play when you get older. So, is genetics part of athletic success? That's a good question. None of us look really happy there. <laughs> Maybe we were exhausted from our pursuits, but you know, that's a question I'm often asked. Where do your genetic gifts come from? And I was um, blessed with a healthy childhood. I was blessed with parents who exposed us to a variety of opportunities, both in you know, athletics, and in play, but also in the arts and music and the sciences. And so that led to the balance that I think is so important today in one's life. But I really think more of it, more of, athlete, more of the athletic success that athletes experience today is due to their passion for their sport and their work. And this was my first track meet. I was visiting cousins and we went to a gymkhana in their community, and I just ran. And I had a tip from a fellow pa a parent in the, in the audience. And she said, look at Thomas run. See how he carries his arms. And I was going like, what? What's, how are his arms different from anybody else's? And his arms were moving like little pistons, and everybody else had clenched arms like this. So I've just sort of listened and I've picked up tips along the route of my career. And I do everything pretty much by the seat of my pants. You know, I have sort of a, a, a gut feeling for the things that I do. And in my heart, I know that what I do might not work for somebody else, but it's going to work for me. So if it's going to work for me, why, why try something different? You can't run anybody else's race in life, is what I'm trying to say. You can only run your own race. What works for me on a starting line isn't necessarily going to work for you on a starting line. So athletics is, I think, based on, athletic success is based on genetics, but it's also based on passion and desire to work hard. And I have a few slides um, of examples. If you don't have passion, you don't have fire. And if you don't have fire, you can't ignite anything. Now, this looks like a forest fire, but it's not. It's a sunset. I love being out in the environment. And I think it's important in order to have success in life, whether it be in the workplace or on the playing fields, you need to be comfortable in the environment in which you're training or working. Because if you're not comfortable in the environment, then you can't expect to work as hard as you need to work to experience success. Um, never look back. And my husband said something very similar in the video. You can't look back. What's done is done, and you have to move forward. And I look forward. I, I look forward all the time. I have disappointments, but I never look back. And I've actually never looked back during a race. And I've never dropped out of a race. 
And I think that someday I'll look forward to telling grandchildren that those two things have been um, very important to me throughout my career. And the other thing is um, that you have to believe in what you're doing. No shortcuts. And there's also no substitute for um, a hard work ethic. If you were to go for a run with me, I never cut the tangents. I always take the long way around because I think that you can really benefit from doing a little extra work in order to um, achieve the goal you set for yourself. So this is a, a picture of the uh, north woods of Maine. And that's actually a Nordic ski trail. And I do a lot of cross-country skiing in the winter to balance my running. And I don't train at altitude. I've never trained at altitude. Um, and there are differences of um, beliefs in, in that field as well. I think it's more important to experience four distinct seasons and to make adaptations to those four different seasons in order to develop strength. So in the winter, I do a lot of Nordic skiing because as a runner, I have stronger legs. And as a Nordic skier, I have to develop my upper body strength. And if I can upper develop my upper body strength, then I become more efficient because now I have a stronger upper body to match the strength of my lower body. So um, because I've balanced, again, the word balance, my upper body with the strength of my lower body, I run more efficiently. And so in the winter, um, this is what I love to do. Plus, it takes away some of the pounding. This was, a, was taken this winter. We had a lot of snow in Maine this winter. And with El Nino um, coming this year, we're expected to have another tough winter. But snow is not an excuse. And again, instead of altitude, I just endure the elements that are put on my road surfaces, so to speak. OK, this is a picture of, of my garden at home. And that's my weight work in the inset. That's seaweed that washes up on the coast. And I mulch my garden with the seaweed. So I don't go into the gym and lift weights. I just do things in daily acts of living that strengthen my body. So at this particular time of year, in the spring and in the summer, I am busy in my garden, preparing the garden beds, hoeing the, the beds, tilling the beds, and then mulching with the seaweed. And then when fall comes, I'll start to harvest the produce. The leaves will come down. I'll start to um, rake the leaves, glean the garden, and then it's time to stack the wood and bring the wood into the house to keep the house warm in the morning, so in, in the winter. So I don't do weightlifting or core exercises per se. I live what I am. And that's sort of a holistic approach to sport. But for me, it's worked. And every time I go into a gym to lift weights or to do core strengthening, I seem to do too many reps and, and I get injured. So. I don't subscribe to that. Many of you probably think I'm crazy, but again, that works for me, and it may not work for you. But I am who I am, and my life is whole, and I'm very passionate about what I do. OK, there are days when I just feel like my legs are heavy, and you, know, you just can't do the work that you expect to do. This is um, a statue in art form in, in Chicago. And um, my legs some days feel like that. Do I take a day off? Occasionally. Do I cut back on my workout expectations? Yes. I run the way I feel, and I rest when I need to rest. And um, I have a brother who's a doctor, and he harps on me all the time that rest is the basis of all activity. I probably don't rest as much as I should, but I'll rest when I'm dead, I guess. <laughs> OK, now we're back into um, children and sport. Um, did I participate in athletics as a youngster? Yes. Um, were there a lot of competitions for me as a young girl? No, because Title IX legislation hadn't become law. But today, kids have the opportunity to participate in a lot of, of different sports. And I think they should play the sport of the season up until the age of 14. And because they can experience different sports, they're going to develop different strengths. 
and they're going to learn more about who they are and what they're passionate about. So today in road racing, there are a lot of kids' races in conjunction with the adult races. And I think that's important that families can get together on weekends and participate as a family in an event as opposed to going into organized sports. Uh, we have two children. I remember spending many weekends dragging our daughter to soccer games all over New England. And, you know, was that really benefiting the health of the family? I don't think so. Was our son engaging in a sport that he'd have for life? I don't think so. So I think it's important to expose children to sports that they can enjoy for a lifetime, whether it be running, which is very accessible and affordable, whether it's tennis, whether it's swimming, whether it's biking. But I think young children need to experience sports that they can engage in for a lifetime, not just the big sports of basketball, baseball, hockey, football, whatever, because you need an entire team to play those sports. And oftentimes, you're going to sustain injuries in those sports that will curtail, curtail your ability to engage in physical fitness throughout your life. So uh, believe it or not, um, that was our daughter in the front of the pack in the last picture. This is our daughter this spring. I never thought I'd have the opportunity to engage in a sport that I'm so passionate about with a child and have her uh, share that same passion. So it's a real gift for me to be able to really enjoy my sport, which has now become her sport on her own. Her passion was in Nordic skiing, and um, now she runs to stay fit. Okay, finish lines. Are there really finish lines in one's life? I'm sure you all recognize who this is on the left. It's Roger Bannister, who ran the first sub uh, four minute mile in May of 1954. This is Roger Bannister very recently. Um, his story, his decision not to finish his career but to go on and inspire others to achieve their dreams and goals has been very important and very impactful in our sport. So we all have stories to tell and share with others. And in the video clip, I mentioned that some of the stories that are most inspiring are the stories at the end of the pack. We all, as people, have our stories that, whether we realize it or not, can inspire those with whom we interact. So I think storytelling is really, really important. OK. It looks like I'm crossing a finish line on the left and then again on the right yet I say there is no finish line. The picture on the left was the Olympic trials. I can't, in Olympia, Washington in May of 1984. And I ran that um, race on a prayer. I'd had arthroscopic knee surgery 17 days before the Olympic trials. And the only reason the physician did the surgery because he thought that I might have a chance to recover in time for the 3,000 meter trials, which were a month later. I went into that surgery knowing that I would never be able to make it through 26.2 miles with the problem that was plaguing me with my right, on my right knee. I couldn't m move my, my um, joint, my lateral, uh, there was a real tightness on the lateral side of my right knee and I couldn't stride out. So after taking a course of anti-inflammatories, um, it was decided that arthroscopic surgery was the last um, opportunity for me to have a shot at getting back to, run the three, to running the 3,000 meter trials. But I knew if I had the surgery and if it was successful, I was going to find my way to the starting line of the marathon trials because you can't have a finish line if you don't have a starting line. And uh, I had the surgery and it was ambulatory day surgery and Dr. James said to me, um, when I woke up, I said to Dr. James, if you go in and find I have a major problem that needs major surgery, don't wake me up to tell me so. Just do what you need to do, and when I recover, I recover. But hopefully I'll recover in time to run in the marathon trials. And he still thought I was crazy. Uh, so I woke up in a hospital room, and shortly thereafter he came in and he said, are you surprised to be here? And I said, well, I guess you found more than I bargained for. 
And he said, well, not exactly, but your reputation has preceded you. And if I discharge you today, I know you'll go out and test that leg tonight. <laughs> and, and he was darn right. So he kept me in the hospital for 24 hours with my egg, leg uh, um, wrapped up and elevated. And then when I was discharged, I waited one day. And then I went out and tested it. And four days later, um, I started to run easily. And then uh, on day 10, I said, if I can go out and run 17 miles, I don't know why I chose 17 miles, but if I can run 17 miles, then I'll go to the Olympic trials in Olympia, you know, six days later. And, and for some reason, it all came together for me, and I was able to, to run in the Olympic trials and, and qualify. And I'll tell you, I, the last six miles of that race, the last 6.2 miles, actually, because the marathon is 26.2 miles, and oftentimes marathoners forget about the point two at the end of the marathon. <laughs> and that point two can be the most challenging, most difficult part of a marathon. Um, I made it to the finish line, and that gave me the opportunity to go on to the Olympics in L.A. So when I went to L.A., um, I uh, marched in the Parade of Athletes. It started at Santa Monica College, and I was in the last position because the U.S. was the host nation, and as the smallest or shortest member of our de U.S. delegation, I was in the caboose position. And I went around the track, and my mantra was, last shall come first and first shall come last. Last shall come first and first shall come last. And I just kept saying that over and over and over again. And um, I didn't know how exactly it was going to play out, um, but it, it played out well. And that gave me the opportunity, coming through the tunnel in L.A., to decide whether or not I was capable of carrying the mantle that came with the championship um, position. And I thought long and hard in that tunnel. And I said to myself, if I come out of that tunnel in first place and can maintain the lead for a lap and a half and win the first women's marathon, I will give back to a sport and to a community that have given so much to me over the many years of my career. And so I finally decided that I was strong enough to, to be able to carry that out, and this was my, um, has been my biggest gift back to the sport of running. This is the starting line of the Beach to Beacon 10K, which starts in my hometown of Cape Elizabeth. And um, our race motto is uh, shine the light on kids. It starts at Crescent Beach State Park, and it finishes at Portland Headlight, which was the first lighthouse commissioned by George Washington. So we dif uh, benefit a different children's charity every year. And it's always a very, very competitive race. And it's all inclusive. We try to include as many athletes, as many people. We have a kids race the night before. This is the start of the wheelchair race um, a year ago. Um, and that woman on the right is Karen um, McWaters, Karen Rand McWaters. And you can see she has a prosthesis, and she unfortunately was at the finish line of Boston in 2013. Oh. And she's become a very good friend and a real inspiration to me. And um, this is Karen finishing the race a month ago. She ran the race, and there she is with her husband, and I was there to greet her. And I'll tell you, it was a hot and humid day, and she looked better than any other runner that came across that finish line. <laughs> So this finish line is really a new beginning, a new starting line for Karen. And again, we engage the children as much as we possibly can. They're very much a part of the race, even on um, race day for the adults, with the kids' race having taken place um, the evening before. Our youngest age group category is 14 and under because we don't want to encourage competitiveness amongst younger age categories. Um, this is the oldest finisher in the race, Dottie Gray at age 90. Um, and she's receiving the um, Johnny Kelly Award. And she just keeps on going. She can't seem to find her finish line either. So there's a wide spectrum of ages involved in our sport. 
and there continue to be um, large spectrums across the whole um, range of, of distances from the 5K to the marathon. And this is the finish line. This is Portland Headlight. And this is why we decided to have our motto, Shine the Light for Kids. Now, I'm a visionary, and I was a visionary um, in starting that event, which was um, supported by, um, at the time, People's Heritage Bank. And I was meeting with the bank president, and I said, I have a vision of starting a race in my hometown and making it a world-class event, and running is one of the few sports um, that accommodates people of all abilities. You can put the best runners in the world side by side with everyday recreational runners and runners who are running for the first time. The name of the bank happened to be Peoples, so this was a race for all the people, so it worked out very well. My next vision is to start a endurance training slash health center where the athletes eat the food that's grown and produced locally on this farm and um, they eat that food to improve their performances, and when their peak training months are um, over, you bring in your unhealthy populations of people with diabetes, cancer, and heart risk, and they eat the same food to improve their health. This is beautiful land, um, and uh, again, experiences four distinct seasons, so the athletes... I don't think need to experience altitude. There's also um, cross-country skiing available, indoor tracks available, and outdoor tracks available. So this is the, the next vision I'm working on. And uh, Dr. Hicks alluded to the fact that um, the environment and physical activity are both near and dear to me. And I liken the fact that prevention is to health what conservation is to the environment. And I think that through... A, effort like this, uh, people will understand that link and um, will all benefit as a result of, of working together on initiatives that build awareness for these two things. Um, running has resulted in many, many friendships um, throughout my career. Uh, this is Mary Wittenberg, the former president of the New York Roadrunners. Um, I said storytelling is very important to me. This was at the finish line of the Boston Marathon in 2013. I had a goal of running a sub-252 uh, marathon because 30 years late, earlier I'd run a 222.43 and I wanted to try to run within 30 minutes of that time. So I achieved my goal. I ran a 251 and walked away having fulfilled another story that had inspired me to get out and run a marathon. And shortly thereafter, that's when the tragedy unfolded. Reasons to exercise. People who don't exercise, who think they should exercise, but really can't get fired up about it, don't have that passion, don't have that fire, um, should look at this list. And I just recently took a picture of this because there's so many reasons to exercise, whether it's because you need to improve your health, whether you want to shed some pounds, whether you want to become more focused, whatever your reason, we all have different motives um, to get out and, and to exercise. And whatever your motive is, and I just encourage you to, to go, with, go with it and, um, and stay physically active. Um, and you have to find the humor in exercise. You know, whether you have heavy legs or not, this is... Uh, was at a race start not uh, uh, too long ago. Run fast, and if you see a moose, run faster. You never know who you're going to meet out there on the roads. And I have come across moose, actually, but I've also come across all sorts of other wildlife, and I've also come across training pa partners who I've caught up with on, on runs. This picture, you probably recognize um, the two men on the left, they've been real role models for me. As I said, I entered the sport before Title IX became law. And I remember watching the 1976 Olympics in, in Montreal and, and Frank Shorter, closest to me, and, and Bill Rogers were running in that race. 
And I remember going out that night after the marathon finished in the darkness of night to run. I was so inspired by what these men had accomplished in Montreal. And when I talk about friendships that have um, spanned a career, these two friendships have been extremely important to me. And I put this picture in because the man on the right is Leon Gorman, who was the chairman of L.L. Bean, which is headquartered in our hometown of Freeport. And Leon passed away um, last week, and L.L. Bean has been a very big sponsor of the Beach to Beacon. And I always like to work with um, acronyms. And I once told L um, Leon that L.L. Bean should stand for live life, be um, engaged in activity um, now. And he didn't write many things down. He was a man of few words, but he wrote that down. And that's pretty much what the company stands for, activity in the outdoors. Uh, so role modeling has, has been very important for me. Now, do you think this is a sunrise or a sunset? How many think it's a sunrise? How many think it's a sunset? It's a sunrise. And I put this in um, the show at the end because there really is no finish line to our days. You know, we go to bed with thoughts of what we might want to accomplish the following day, and then we wake up to try to accomplish those goals we set. And so everything sort of blends together. So really, is there a finish line to our lives and to our ambitions and to the goals we set for ourselves? So I think the best way to tell stories is to set goals for yourself and try to be a little bit creative. And your goals aren't going to be what my goals are, but they're challenges that keep us moving through life in what I hope will be a healthy way for each and every one of us. So um, thank you very much, and it's um, my pleasure to entertain any questions you might have of me after seeing this show. I just hit on upon lots of aspects that have been very meaning to me in my career, and I've run many races that haven't, um, haven't been um, recognized in this show, and I just thought I'd leave that open to your questions if you had any. Are there any physiologies that are not competent to run? Because running has never felt good to me. I'm a flat-footed person. And I often wonder if the running shoes that are being sold in the stores are 90% not, not right for any of us. But is there anything, any advice you could give to somebody who considers themselves a, a genetically non-runner um, <laughs> to, to inspire us to try one more time? Thanks. First of all, um, that's a very good question. And what works for me isn't going to work for you. And as I said earlier in my remarks, we all have to run our own race. So if running's not working for you, then maybe you will be a walker. Um, maybe you will be a Nordic walker. I see more and more people walking with poles. And I think that happens for two reasons. I think people are discovering that by moving your arms with your legs, you're enjoying improved fitness for the entire body, not just the lower body. And also, I think older people are wanting to stay physically active, and the poles aid them with balance. So I would recommend before you throw your hands up with the sport of running to maybe try some soft orthotics in your shoes. Don't follow the gimmicks that are put in front of you constantly. Um, have a have a orthopedic surgeon or a podiatrist look at your your feet, look at your gait, and if orthotics are prescribed, I would suggest you try that before you throw in the towel. And also, I would recommend that if anybody recommends hard orthotics for you, you ask for soft orthotics.
Yes. Here. Um, do I have a coach or do I train by myself or who do I train with? All of the above at one time or another in my career. It's very, do we have coaches in the audience today? I have a great deal of respect for you. Um, it's very hard for a coach to gauge an athlete's fitness and ability to recover both physiologically and mentally. And when you're coaching an entire team, everybody's going to recover differently. Some people are going to um, be able to recover very quickly from long runs, but not so quickly from speed workouts and vice versa. So you're trying to oversee an entire team and do what's best for everybody, and that's a very difficult task. So I have had coaches during different careers, di during different periods in my career, but not constantly. When I think I need advice, I will, I will confer with a coach with whom I've had in the past or with whom I have respect. But most of my running is done on my own. Again, it's a gut instinct. I run the way I feel. I do like to have somebody to train with during my um, speed workouts and during my long runs. And I thought in 2008, when the Olympic trials were in Boston, Olympic marathon trials were in Boston. I thought that was going to be my last competitive marathon because I'd started my career in Boston in 1979 with, with a 235, and I thought it appropriate to end my career at the age of 50 where I started my career. So I set a goal. Again, I was trying to tell another story. I said I'd like to go out and run a sub-250 marathon at the age of 50, and then I'll call it a career. Well, I achieved that goal by the skin of my teeth, was greeted by the three qualifiers for the um, Olympic marathon that year, then walked away thinking my career was finished. A year later, I got a call from Mary Wittenberg, the same woman you saw at the finish line of Boston in 2013, asking me if I'd come to New York to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the New York City Marathon, which coincided, excuse me, the 40th anniversary of the New York City Marathon, which coincided with my 25th Olympic um, anniversary. And uh, my goal was to try to run another sub-250 marathon, which I was able to do. The following year, I get a call from Kerry Pinkowski in Chicago asking me if I wanted to come to Chicago to try to run another sub-250. Sub Again, I'm creeping up in age. I'm 50, I was 53 then. And I achieved that goal with the help. It was the 25th anniversary of my fastest time in Chicago. And the date of the race was October 10th. 2010, so 10, 10, 10, those numbers aligned almost as well as moving through life aligns with there is no finish line. And so I went to Chicago, and then I did something totally crazy. I went to the Athens Marathon less than a month later because it was the 200th, 25th, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Marathon, and I said anybody who's been in the sport as long as I have should experience that anniversary run in <coughs> Athens over the original marathon course. And so the stories continue, and the next story on tap is for me to return to Chicago in a few weeks to try to run within 30 minutes of my fastest marathon time ever, which was a 2.21.21 in 1985. So I will be trying to run a sub 2.51.21 in Chicago in a couple weeks. So it's, it's dangling the carrot, finding a story to tell, and then going out to tell that story. And we all have the capacity and the abilities and the talents to tell those stories. And I do what I do to inspire myself, and if anybody gains inspiration for what I'm, what I'm doing, that's a, a bonus. But I truly love what I'm doing, and for those of you who love your, your work or your passions, or love your work or your hobbies or whatever it might be, um, I think you'll experience what many of us experience in the sport of running, and that's the runner's high. Yes. How are my knees now? <laughs> <laughs> my knees are, are fine. I've, you know, I, I think it's, again, I, I credit that to balancing my life. The Nordic skiing in the winter takes a lot of the pounding, takes, you know, the weight bearing off my joints. Um, I do a lot of kayaking in the summer, so that helps with my upper body strength when I can't do the Nordic skiing and when I'm doing some of the gardening. So I just sort of move it around and, and try not to, to put too much of a load on any part of my constitution, if you will. 
Do I take glucosamine? No, I don't take glucosamine because there's a muscle, a shellfish extract in one of those, in most of those um, tablets or gel, gel tablets, and uh, I would go into anaphylaxis if I, if I had glucosamine. As a matter of fact, I don't take any supplements. You know, I, my approach is very holistic. I eat what I crave. I eat as close to home as I possibly can, farm to table. I know that's a big movement now. I once heard an herbalist say that if you're taking an herb um, or a food as a panacea, and if it's not grown within 100 miles of your domicile, chances are you aren't going to benefit from whatever that herb or, or food is. Yes. Do you watch your diet? Who, where'd that question come from? Do I watch my diet? I'm on strict seafood diet. I see food and I eat it. <laughs> <laughs> you, go ahead. Obviously, you eat, very, you eat very healthy, but what do you do about protein? What do I do about protein? Yeah, you eat meat. I do eat met, meat. I, um, I eat free range whenever possible, um, and I eat a lot of fish. Wild caught when possible. I eat a lot of legumes. Um, I eat all around the the plate, so to speak. When we were young, my mother said, "If um, I serve you a colorful uh, plate at dinner, chances are you're getting all the vitamins and minerals you need." And I think there's a lot of truth to that. I had a question about um, pacing. Do you do you subscribe to negative splits? Do you try to run that second half faster, or do you do even splits? I run the way I feel. <laughs> I totally run. When I set the uh, then American record in Boston in 1983, I went through the first 10 miles in 51.30, and everybody, I think that was an American record in the 10 miles at that time. But I was literally running the way I felt. It caught up with me, but not so much that it, it ruined an American record effort. But I just, you know, you can't get up in somebody else's, caught in somebody else's race. In the 1984 Olympics, when I decided to bypass the first water station, the commentators thought I was absolutely crazy and that I'd blown the race because they couldn't believe I was bypassing the water station on such a hot and humid day. What I was doing in my head was getting out of the pack because I was taking stutter steps and I wasn't running very efficiently. And I knew I had to, again, run my own race, find my own stride and go with it. And I thought everybody would follow, but for some reason they didn't. So some days I run negative splits. Ideally, I'd love to run negative splits. I think too many runners go out too fast. And mentally, it's much easier to pass runners at the end of a race than it is to be passed. So if you can run negative splits and train accordingly, that's a great way to go. Yeah, yes. I was, um, <clears throat> what you said about children and play really resonated for me in my own childhood that there was a lot of play become before organized sports, how do you have ideas for how our culture, our society, how, how can people do that? What does it take? Are there elements you're promoting there? I wish I had the, the answer. I think um, in a lot of school systems, because of budget cuts, physical education is the first, first discipline to go. And I think especially in the elementary grades, it's very important to keep physical activity, you know, as available as possible, especially in this day when we see an increase in Asperger's and ADD and things like that. I think kids need to air it out and get out there, and then they won't be as disruptive in the classroom. I think families need to take stock of what's really important to them and the welfare of their families, you know, as a... As an elite athlete, um, I always would schedule my day around my running. As a matter of fact, I split my career into two phases, BC and AD, before children and after diapers. And those of you who are parents can understand that all of a sudden you're dealing with somebody else's life and not just your own life, and you're responsible for this young person. So before children, I would always make my running a priority and schedule my day around my running. After children, I had to schedule my running around my day because they came first. So anytime we could incorporate um, a family activity into our, our day that included the children, whether it's running with a child on a bicycle next to you, whether it's putting a child in a jogging stroller, whether it's um, 
going to a park and letting the kids play while you run around in circles. You know, you just have to figure it out. And, you know, oftentimes I would run to an airport because that's the only day or part of the day I had to get exercise if I was leaving children with a sitter and had a ride to the airport. I mean, you just have to juggle constantly. You just constantly have to balance and, and set your priorities. And that's what I use running for. I never plug in when I'm out running. It gives me a, a time of day to air it out and to prioritize what's truly important in my life. So I like to be unplugged. Yes. The Yasso 800 plan, I don't know if you're all familiar with that. I think I know what you're talking about. That is using running 800 meter um, uh, runs, a series of 800 meter runs at your marathon race pace. So if you want to run a 250 marathon, you would go out and run repeat 250 800 meter runs. I think that's, there's a lot of um, credibility um, to that method. And I never take more than half the recovery of the actual interval. So if I'm running three, if I'm wanting to run a three hour marathon, I would not take more than one and a half minutes of recovery. And I would probably do anywhere between six and 10 repeats. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, hi, I'm hi. Jeannie Reyes and I feel honored to meet you and that um, I can't believe you're I'm here oh, listening thank to you, speak you because I remember the race and I was very excited when you won I have a couple questions is um, do you wear Nike running shoes <laughs> yes I and do wear how Nike often do you have to change because when I used to run I think it was every three months up in San Francisco I mean you would wear out your the soles of your shoes and I didn't realize how expensive it was <laughs> But then I had knee problems, so I went to, I changed my sport to swimming. So I've been swimming for 40 years. But um, also, what do you eat before you train? Okay, um, those are a lot of questions. So let me, <laughs> let, first of all, thank you for your um, kind comments. Uh, the running shoes. Uh, I've been a Nike athlete for, for many, many years. They've kept me in the game as long as they have. They keep changing their shoes and, you know, I, I always sort of hoard a few pairs and make the transition gradually to new shoes if I don't know how that particular shoe is going to feel on my foot and how it's going to um, impact my running. So um, the important thing here is not to let your shoes wear out. And if you do let your shoes wear out and then you introduce a brand new pair of shoes, you're making a considerable change. So to avoid that considerable change, I always have two shoes going at the same time. So when one wears out, I'm not introducing such a drastic change. I'm inserting the half-worn shoe and then the new shoe and alternating those shoes. So you have to make changes gradually. And so that's one way to avoid a huge, a huge um, opportunity for injury. Right, the same, the same variety, if you will. Um, if you want to try something new, that's also a good time to introduce a new style or a new shoe when you have a pair of shoes going that you're very comfortable in. Oftentimes, if I'm feeling a tweak in my knee or my ankle, I'll finish a run, I'll look at the bottom of the soles of my shoes, and I'll see that I've worn through to the midsole. It's time to get rid of the shoe. I try to catch that before it happens, but sometimes I get so busy thinking of other things, I forget to check my tires, so to speak. So introduce change gradually. Yes. Hi there. Um, Hi. With the age group that you grew up in marathon, you know, in the men's side, they used to run like maybe 50 to 100 miles and so on and so on per week or two weeks and stuff like that. How was your regiment, you know, as a woman? How, what, what did you do? Did you copy some of it or did you try to mimic the men's side of marathon because they've been running for so long and this was like, you know, you getting women actually getting into marathon. Well, again, I was in the right place at the right time with, with Title IX. I, I showed you a picture of Bill and Frank who have truly been there for me all these years. 
I was new in the sport. Actually, the Beach to Beacon 10K, the race I founded in my hometown, finishes in Fort Williams, which when I was growing up didn't allow vehicular traffic on its road. So that's where I would go to run, to hide from the public, if you will. I grew up, as you saw, with three brothers, so I was trying to shed that tomboy image, and that was a safe haven for me because I was following my heart and living my dreams by, by just running. Um, so what worked for me and what continues to work for me in marathoning, marathon training, how many active marathoners do we have in the audience right now? So quite a few. I count three months back from the targeted date of the marathon. And at that point, I try to accommodate three important workouts or three significant workouts or what I consider critical workouts to my buildup. One is a long run, which is 16 to 20 miles. One is a medium long run, which would be 12 to 15 miles. And I try to push the pace on that. The long run, I run the way I feel that particular day. And then some sort of a speed workout. That could be a 5K race, a 10K race, you know, maybe a half marathon. It could be a fartlek type workout, speed play. And for me, that's eyeing a telephone pole, you know, half mile, quarter mile down the road and trying to beat the next car that comes up from behind to that pole. I'm constantly playing games with myself. I'm constantly changing it up. So those are the three important workouts. If you do nothing else, if you hit those three workouts leading up to your marathon, you're apt to have a good outcome. Yes? I wear a fairly heavy training shoe. I wear the Nike Pegasus. Because then when I put on my racing shoes, I feel like I have feathers on my feet. <laughs> so I like the change. It's the same reason I don't take the shortcuts in training. Because when I can cut the tangents in a race course, that's a real treat. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I'm glad I came to this session. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you came too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to one of our friends. Uh, Seven, eight years ago, I started running on the streets outside my house, and I tried it, but I couldn't. So I want your suggestion what I should do if I want to start again. Why couldn't you run when you tried it eight years ago? Because... What happened? Because I felt I would injure my knees. You were afraid you injured, you, did you injure your knees or were you afraid you would injure I your knees? I was knee? afraid. Well, it looks like you have a slight frame and that you're, you're made to run. So what I would suggest is that you don't run for distance, but you run for time and you gradually build your time segments. So maybe go out and run for a minute and then walk for a minute, run for two minutes, walk for two minutes run for three minutes, maybe up to five minutes, and then come back down the ladder. Yeah, I also tried, you know, playing with the basketball, running around the basket. Oh, running around, bouncing a basket? Yeah, bouncing. Yeah. Yeah. You but know, whatever moves ago. you to move, just move. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm 68. You're 68. I have to catch up with you then. I have <laughs> another decade to do so. I don't know whether I can do it. Well, if Dottie can do it, who you sh saw in the film, you can do it. Th you know, I'm inspired by the people who discover running later in life. And these are the runners in my age group now who are breaking new barriers because they have fresh legs, so to speak. And it's <laughs> okay. amazing what some of these people can do. Some of them come from different athletic backgrounds, but it's new and they get hooked. They get the runners high and they push themselves. And to see these people pushing themselves during retirement ages is quite an interesting phenomenon. Uh, what do you suggest uh, uh, a diet for a vegetarian? Are you a vegetarian? Yes. Um, I really don't want to go there because I think <laughs> it's important to have um, meat in one's diet if they're going to, if you're going to be no, I want to do a little bit of running. Excuse me? You don't eat don't a lot of beans? Uh, yes. That's probably, uh, I don't know if you eat eggs or, or fish. Uh, no. Uh, no. So, you know... I do have pulses, lentils, beans. Yeah, those are all good things. Keep the protein yeah. as high as you can with yeah. a vegetarian diet. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hello, Joan. Hi. I wondered if stretching 
That was a big part of your recovery. <laughs> You're speaking to the wrong person. <laughs> I think stretching is totally overrated. But it, <laughs> you know, I, you know, again, I live by the seat of my pants. I do what feels right. I jog into my runs. I jog out of my runs. I don't do a lot of stretching. If I'm feeling a tightness, I will stretch gently. I tried to do yoga for a year. It was the worst year of running I ever <laughs> had. Um, but what I do is, in the summer months, I'm able to access the ocean because we live on tidal frontage. So I try to time, especially my longer runs and harder runs around the tide so I can swim afterwards. And that's what loosens me up. Uh, but, you know, I do not do a lot of stretching and people hate to s hear me say that, but other people like for me to say that. Whatever works for you, go with it. And if it's, st stretching obviously doesn't work for me. Um, every once in a while I do need to be stretched out. I do get regular massage, but I don't do a lot of stretching. Yes. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, I have a different kind of question, really, since this is a exercise medicine lectures. Do you think running distances like marathon is a good medicine or a bad medicine? A good, do I think running marathoning, running marathons is a good medicine or a bad medicine? Yes, for most people. Well, I tell people all the time you don't have to run marathons to be a runner. Many people who shouldn't run marathons run marathons. Um, have any of you run with team and training? Yes? I applaud the efforts of team and training. I think what they're doing is absolutely wonderful. Um, we need more research in lymphoma and leukemia. We need more funding. But sometimes they recruit people who should not be running marathons to go the 26.2 miles. There are plenty of team and training opportunities in half marathons and 10Ks and 5Ks. And I like to see people enter the sport of road racing or running for the long run, no pun intended. I want it to be a sustainable part of their life, something that can sustain in their lives for a lifetime. And some of these people who shouldn't be running r race marathons because they're overweight or they have a health issue never come back to run after completing that marathon. So um, I, I just say, if it's done in moderation and your training is done appropriately and you have the right physique and physiology to run marathons, I think it's fine. If you're going to run a marathon every week, I think that's crazy. And there are those people out there. I mean, they will, you know, destination marathoners. They're going to run a marathon a month. They're going to run a marathon a week. They're going to run a marathon in every continent. I don't subscribe to that type of marathoning. I think in order to keep um, health, stay healthy, you shouldn't run more than two marathons a year. And it's not only the buildup and the training, it's the recovery. I have heard it said, and I believe, that for every mile of the marathon, it takes a day to recover. So it essentially takes a month to fully recover from a marathon, and that's just physically. Mentally, it's really tough to get your head around a marathon if you're gonna give it your best effort. So again, it's balancing your training, it's not overdoing it, and it's just being smart about marathoning. So it can be bad medicine, or it can be good medicine. <laughs> <laughs> Joan, next one over there. Hi, I stopped running because of lower back pain. Have you ever experienced that, or is there a way around that? Um, for you, probably some stretching. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, um, do use a foam roller now. That's not stretching, that's rolling. You didn't ask me about rolling. You asked me about stretching. But if you feel an injury coming over, off on, it's important for you to address it as soon as possible. So some stretching, um, just hanging, you know, from a bar or from a table or from whatever perch you might find um, might work. Um, but I have not had a lot of lower back pain. I've had some piriformis, piriformis and some hamstring, but not a lot of lower back. John? Here. Hi, John. Thanks. I'm Dan Cooper. I'll be speaking yes. later about children and exercise. I just wanted Pleasure to comment. Pleasure and honor. Thank you. My honor. 
I think, uh, I just wanted to comment quickly on your previous comment and how important it is. And that is we can't take uh, exercise in all of its form and fit them, for example, to every child with congenital heart disease or with cystic fibrosis. And we have to really understand what it is about exercise and growth to be able to make that match as effective as possible. And you're so right. If you introduce a child like that to exercise, which is above their physiological ability to perform it, they'll never exercise again. So thank you very much for bringing that out. Thank you. Next one over there. Um, yes, and Hi. you've been very patient, so you're next. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, I just, um, you mentioned that at, at your race that you um, have benefited a variety of children's charities. And what I'm wondering is the thing that concerns me most is getting young people, especially communities of color and lower socioeconomic levels active, whether that's walking, running, or something else. Um, and so I'm wondering, do you know of a particular charity that does a good job with this? And if no such charity exists that you know of, then I would challenge you to get together with some of the other good role models and form such a charity. Well, thank you. Uh, never enough hours in a day. The sun sets too quickly and then the sun rises right on top of the setting sun. Um, you know, for us, the charity that we've benefited that comes the closest to what you're suggesting is the Boys and Girls Club, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. In our community, we have a lot of Somalians and Sudanese, and we're trying to mainstream and integrate those children into, you know, normal sports for, you know, indigenous kids. Um, so, um, you know, it's a constant effort because you have different, beliefs, different cultures, and it's, it's, it's tough, but we're seeing more and more minority and socioeconomically challenged kids participating in, in sports in our community. And we have a um, community that uh, I love to walk through. And you know what? Those kids are playing. They're not in organized sports. They're playing. And I think they're going to be the future stars in American sports. Um, can I ask, uh, let this woman ask a question. She's been very patient. Um, I just wanted to say congratulations on your career. Thank you for um, all the inspiration you set forth. And my question is, I don't like to run with water, even long runs. And am I making a mistake? And my second one, is there anyone you've always wanted to run with that you haven't gotten the chance to? Oh, those are good questions. Um, this woman says she doesn't like to run with water. Is that a mistake? And have, is there anybody I haven't run with who I would like to run with? Did I miss something? Um, I don't run with water. For some reason, I'm able to run long distances without water. When I'm racing, I do take water at the water stops, and I take water more frequently than any um, energy replacement drink. Uh, occasionally, on a really hot day, I have found myself grabbing somebody's hose, <laughs> hoping that they don't filter, you know, um, fertilizer into the hose somehow that I don't <laughs> know about. But, uh, you know, I can count the times on one hand during my... 40 plus year career that I've had to stop and do that. I just try to stay hydrated throughout the day. A lot of people run with the fuel belts or with water. Yesterday I ran with a young student, I don't know if he's in the audience today, but he carried a bottle of water in his hand and three water bottles in his little backpack. And I thought, <laughs> oh my God, you know, talk about lower back pain. Um, <laughs> so again, what works for me isn't necessarily going to work for you. Um, Hyponutremia is a huge issue in our sport, as is dehydration. So, again, you have to find that balance. A lot of times, and even this morning when I was out running, I saw somebody had stashed some water, you know, beside a tree trunk. And if you know where you're going, that's a good idea if you're worried about dehydration. Um, is there anybody I haven't run with who I'd like to run with? You. You know, I, my I, um, <laughs> you know, it's, again, friendships in the sport. I've met people all around the country, all around the world, just by running up from behind or, or catching up with them or 
having them you know, run in my direction and then turning around to, to join them. And, and that actually happened this morning. Way up back. Hyponotremia? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Wow. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm sure he lives on in all the lives he touched through his, his running. Do I do drills and form drills? <laughs> do I stretch? If I don't stretch, do you think I do form drills? <laughs> uh, you know, my time is limited. I just get out and run and then get on with the next thing. I do, um, you know, when I finish runs, I find butt kicks are helpful. So I, you know, usually slow down and then we'll do, and I might even turn around and do a couple of drills of, of butt kicks, but um, that's about it. And, and sometimes some soldier steps, but uh, I'm not gonna try it right here because I'd probably pull the hamstring right off my, <laughs> my pelvic bone. Yes. Hi Joan, thank you. Thank you for sharing so much of yourself with us. Um, I have a curiosity about fitness and the brain especially as I'm aging. And I was wondering, have you noticed, um, for example, any significant changes with your focus in terms of as the years progress? I'm kind of very interested in that. It's very hard for me, especially as I age, to stay on task when I haven't exercised. And um, I spoke to a group yesterday and I talked about having dealt with some anxiety when I was a young mother um, in my AD days after diapers or during diapers. And I had cut my mileage back drastically just because I didn't have the time or the energy to run. And I really cut it almost in half. And I had a lot of anxiety as a result of doing that. And I never medicated, but I did a lot of reading and um, you know, tried to do some exercises to overcome that anxiety. But what I found um, what really worked was adding one more run, adding one long run to my week that I had let go of. And I would go out and run 12 or 13 miles once a week and, you know, ran it as hard as I was capable of doing so. And that seemed to elevate my endorphins again. And within a couple of weeks, the anxiety went away. So I think exercise and brain are directly related. And I think as we age, we probably lose a little bit of focus because we're not able to do the intensity, the, get to the level of intensity that we were when we were younger with our workouts. So do I get foggy sometimes? Yes. Um, and I think it's just because, um, you know, I'm not able to, to work out at the level that I did at the height of my career. But I find that, you know, as long as I get a decent run in, I'm able to stay on task fairly well. Hi, um, I'm, I'm coming from a half marathoner type running experience myself, as well as interest in sports psychology. So some of my questions relate to, you know, how your mind is involved in what you're doing. So as you're setting goals for yourself to be two, below 250 and all of that, um, and let's say you have a bad run or you go to a race and you just, you know, you're not going to make it, like, how do you not let your your goals and what people will think of you, the expectations as an athlete um, hinder your performance, um, as well as um, when you are doing your training or competing, do you find that you have to concentrate and like just be very focused on your sport or do you find you're, you kind of dissociate, like how when we drive we dissociate? <laughs> um, and then thirdly, um, when you hit the wall or if you ever hit a wall, <laughs> what are some tools that you found to be helpful for yourself as you're running your races? Thank you. Those are a lot of questions. So 
talking about staying on task. Um, I think that uh, I, I, I try to tell a story which sets a goal for myself and sometimes, and I've gone out on a limb a little bit heading into Chicago to say publicly that I'd like to run within 30 minutes. I, I'm not saying I am going to, I'm saying I'd like to. And that's what really motivates me to get through that training so I don't disassociate during this particular time because I have a task at hand, I have a goal I'm shooting for. You know, there are days when I go out and totally disassociate from what I'm doing and, um, you know, these GPS watches, this is a, a, a Nike Plus watch. Um, but I like it because the digital display is so big um, that I can read it while I'm running. But it's a tool of a devil because if I look down and I'm running 743 pace, why am I not running 730 pace? And if I've run 8.9 miles, why am I not running 10 miles? So I think sometimes with these devices, it's a little easier to overtrain and leave our racing on the roads. So if I don't have a, a goal in mind, I disassociate and my running is what it is. When I'm training for something specifically, then I tend to be more focused on what I'm doing and I um, run it, run accordingly. What else, you asked me one more question. Um, yeah, so like what, what do you tell yourself when you hit that wall, when oh. your motivation tanks? For me in the marathon, it's mile 17. If I can get through mile 17 and I feel pretty good, then I know I can get through the rest of the marathon. If I start looking for mile markers before the 10 mile mark, I know I'm in trouble. <laughs> and if I start looking for the first mile, I know I'm in trouble. I just brought, <laughs> you know, what I do is the marathon in sports psychology, the marathon can seem like a daunting distance. It's 26.2 miles. So why not break the distance down? And that's exactly what I do. So I do a lot of six mile runs. I do a lot of 10 mile runs. I do a lot of 12 mile runs. So I say, okay, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna run a 10 mile training run. So 10 miles are in my wake. Then I say, okay, I'm gonna go race a 10K. And so then I try to, I'm more aware of where I am and I've gotta gear up a little bit. And then I say, okay, now I've got 16 miles behind me and I, 10 miles is a popular distance for me, so I just have 10.2 miles to go. <laughs> and as I said earlier, you want to keep something in reserve because it's much easier mentally to be passing people at the end of, of a race. And um, I hesitate to bring up his name, but one year I ran the New York City Marathon with Lance Armstrong, and he had a goal of breaking a three-hour marathon. And um, Alberto Salazar ran him through the first 10. I was going to run him through the second 10. And then Al Garouge was going to run him through the final 6.2. And I got to the 20 mark, and I was Lance Sherpa. I had all his, his um, nutrition in a baggie pinned inside my short, and he wanted water at every stop. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, he wanted to know if he was on pace. And... We got to mile 25, and he was pretty close to his goal time of sub three hours. And then um, he backed off a little bit because he thought he had it made in the shade. And I said, Lance, you know, we're going to be really tight. You've forgotten about the point, too. And that's why I mentioned it earlier in <laughs> my remarks. And he started to run like heck. But um, you have to break the marathon distance up. Otherwise, it seems, seems too daunting. And I was ready to bow out at 20 miles, and I was asked to stay with him because Al Garouge is a track runner. He'd never run a marathon, and they thought he was going to run him into the ground before he got to the finish line. So, <laughs> Great. Yes, thank you for all you've shared today. Earlier you mentioned a comment about protein for runners, the, the nece necessity. And I just wa was wondering if you would elaborate on that in terms of in your training program and also in your recovery. I, I don't run, but I hike, and there are times after I'm done with a long hike, I'm just, no matter what I eat, I just seem tired the rest of that day, sometimes the following day. So I'd appreciate your comments. Okay, hiking. It's funny you mention that. I, I do a lot of hiking myself, and I have been more depleted at the end of a hike than I have at the end of a marathon. And I think it's just because I'm out there for a longer period of time. So I think 
if somebody can develop, and maybe there is out there, time-released protein, um, that would be a good thing. Uh, I think uh, dehydration may be coming into play. It might not just be that your protein stores are depleted, but you may be dehydrated. And I find oftentimes it's not the nutrition as much as it is the water balance that, that slows me down and makes me feel lethargic. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I understand people who want to be vegetarians. I respect vegetarians. I respect vegans. Everybody has a reason, whether it's, you know, a philosophical belief or a cultural um, belief or whatever it is. Um, so you have to respect those choices. But when you're looking at athletics and you want to deliver the best you can deliver, you've got to look carefully at what it is that you're eating. So when I'm preparing for a marathon, I have a diet that's high in carbohydrates. The last thing I want to look at after a marathon is carbohydrates. All I want is protein. You know, I want a, I want a hamburger with, with french fries, um, you know. And I don't normally eat that, but my body is so depleted, and that's what I'm, I'm craving. And I very, I very seldomly um, deny cravings. Hi, Joan. I want to thank you for coming today. And uh, I'm a 57-year-old woman, and so I had the benefits of Title IX as well. And that did give us a lot of opportunities. But you especially have been an amazing spokesperson for women's running and now having women be close to 60% of the participants in the sport of running in this country. We can only attribute it to your personal efforts from the very beginning. I've had the good fortune of running in the trials of the U in 84 and in the Carlsbad 5000 in 85. And I know that you are naturally sort of a shy person. And wow, we just can't thank you enough for going out on the road and you know, giving the message to everybody to be active with their family and their friends. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And you must be Catherine. Are you Catherine? Yeah. Oh, because I, Dr. Hicks shared your card with me. Um, and thank you for being there with me in the trials in 1984. And I owe it to the pioneers who preceded me in sport, especially to Roberta Gibb or Bobby Gibb, who was actually the first woman to win and run the Boston Marathon even before Catherine Switzer. And she entered the Boston Marathon as Bobby. So the BAA officials didn't catch the fact that she was actually female, but also I have a lot of teammates out there, including yourself, who have propelled our sport to, to where it is now. And, you know, even on those tough days, you saw those slides of, of winters in Maine. You know, you get out on those days and you, <laughs> I hate to say it, guys, but you see more women out on the roads than you see men. The guys are retreating to the health clubs and <laughs> going inside and uh, we're, we're running the roads. But, uh, you know, again, it comes down to just really pure passion and the desire to push yourself in a way that maintains health. And uh, I've seen too many people just become too obsessed and they lose that balance and, you know, they run into some real health uh, uh, issues, both emotionally and physically. So finding that balance is really critical to all of us. Running for health and running for win. Which was the motiv motivating force in your life? Running for health or running to win? Mm -hmm. uh, running for health. If I never run another road race again, I'll be fine with that. But if you told me I had to stop running tomorrow, I'd have a very difficult time with that. So I have actually taught myself to ride a road bike clipped into the pedals because when the day comes and I can't run, I want to be able to expend um, energy in other ways. And so cycling makes sense. The Nordic skiing makes sense. I'll, you know, it's not a full day for me in the winter if I don't get up and go for a run, then spend the morning um, downhill skiing, then come in for lunch and then go out and cross country ski for a couple hours. And that's, that makes me a triathlete, I hope, because I'm not into Ironman triathlons and things like that. But, you know, what works for you, you know, works for you, and it might not work for me, and what works for me might not work for you. But I think the real key is to just move, to find something that motivates you to move and just keep moving. 
And I think if we can move in our younger lives, we're going to have a much easier time moving as we go through the, the aging process. And, um, you know, we have an aging population now, and we have health care issues that are complicating things very, very, in a very big way. And I think, you know, there need to be more conversations like this and more people doing the research that many of you are doing and just, you know, sort of these think tanks that, that make society a healthier place for us. And I really believe that prevention, which is movement, is critical to improving the entire healthcare system in this country. And I thank each and every one of you. And uh, are we done? <laughs> okay.